from Wakefield, it's the Nolan Carnet Night Show. Why you join Nolan as guest this week, John Stebbins to the show. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's Nolan. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the show. Joining me this week is he's not only a literary uh, person, he is a historian of both music and the Beach Boys. He is a music fan. He is from sunny California. He is the one, the only, the magnificent John Stebbins. How are you doing today, John? Great. Nice to be here. Of course. Well, as we talked uh, talked about a little beforehand, uh, you you have you know a big impact on the Beach Boys world, and for you to want to take the time out to to share your stories and your thoughts on the Beach Boys world is is uh, it shows the type of person that you are. So thank you again. Well, it's nice to be wanted. So thanks <laughs> for having me. Well, that, I I had uh, Jeffrey Cushing Murray who wrote with Carl on la light album and he he shared the the same sentiment which you know that in itself is is interesting because it's such a a great album it's at least some of the material on there there's some other material that is sort um su- suspicious but that's a conversation for another day as i usually like to do and is it's sort of you know interesting times as we find ourselves in the last few years so for you recently how's how's life been as it seems as though so if it's starting going back to normal yeah, it's normal, but it's not, you know, it's kind of ebbs and flows. I mean, um, obviously, um, the whole COVID thing, you know, shutting down was kind of weird for most people. Um, I was actually in already a semi kind of retired mode, so it didn't really affect me that much. And, and at this age, I'm not all that social anymore either. So, <laughs> so, but, but again, it's scary for sure. older people too, you know, because you're know, a pandemic and, and um, you know, that, that whole thing to be around people, I'm kind of a germaphobe anyway, but um, uh, yeah, but I, I get together with friends and play music still. And, you know, that's that, that we kind of had to put that on hold for sure. a while because we, we do it in a close quarters and, and um, once we were, you know, able to relax and start doing that again, that that really felt like things were getting back to normal for me to go to my Sunday night, you know, Sunday night jam sessions with my my friends, you know. So. And you know, it, it probably gives you a greater appreciation just to do some things like going to drive to to those to those things. I, I was thinking about it earlier and leading up to this, looking back on it, you know, people can complain and whatever they want to do, but I was when I was thinking, I was like, man, you know, it gives me a great appreciation to go to a concert and sit and say, okay, let, let's get this show on the road. Let's get this concert going because they weren't going on for, for years. It's good to see that things are sort of going back to normal to be able to go to concerts and not have so many restrictions to be able to go see the Beach Boys, to go be able to see Brian this summer and all the other things. So it, it puts a lot of things in, in perspective. I, I sort of want to start from the beginning, if that's okay with you, talking about sort of your, your journey into this world and sort of music itself. Growing up in Northern California, uh, after doing some research, and you shared this when you went on Beach Boys Talk recently in other interviews that you've done about your entry and how your sister played a big role into getting to the Beach Boys music with Surfing USA. But for you, growing up where you grew up in Northern California, and Darian has mentioned this in interviews, and Proben has as well about their perception and people's perception on the music when they grew up with it. Was the Beach Boys music an appropriate thing to listen to and not get beat up as they've said. Yeah. Cause uh, I'm old enough. Well, actually I was really a little kid, but um, I, when I was first exposed to the beach boys uh, music and their image, um, they were really a trend at that time. So it's, sure. you know, it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to imagine the beach boys being like the new trend, but they yeah. were kind of the trend in my neighborhood and kids were, you know, kids were, I mean, we, you know, we had a kid in our neighborhood that bought a surfboard and was like carrying it around and throwing it in neighbors' swimming pools. And, <laughs> and you know, we're starting to skateboard and people are wearing what they, they called surfer shirts back then. They were just like, you see Brian wearing on all summer long, like sure. big, big wide stripes and, you know, trying to co- cut their hair and comb their hair like Dennis. And, <laughs> and, 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 you know, musically, that style of music um, was, you know, trendy at that time. So the surf, surf music, surf vocal music, maybe. So there's like a year there and it kind of bleeds into the British invasion where this whole kind of um, 
you know, it's like a groundswell of youth sort of um, culture where it just becomes more of an impact. I, I was like six, seven years old when I'm experiencing this, but I remember it vividly sure. that people were trying to, you know, people were talking about and trying to act like the Beach Boys and then people were trying to, you know, act like the Beatles or dress okay. like the Beatles or sure. all that thing. So, so there was no getting beat up at, at that time. It was more like, you know, the Beach Boys were like the coolest thing around. Sure. And then, and then obviously once the British invasion happened, um, it was for some people, it was like, well, that's, that's better. That's more interesting. And for other people were like, no, America's the home team or whatever. Yeah. But for me, uh, I, I, I love both equally. Sure. So I, I didn't have a problem. I was open to it. I just wanted more. And um, yeah, the Beach Boys stayed relevant um, until, you know, I, I can remember hearing Good Vibrations on the radio and thinking, oh, that's kind of almost like a comeback for them sure. because they'd kind of, they'd kind of been off the radio a little, little bit, at least in my in, in my small world, you know, growing up there, because I listened to AM radio religiously. And, um, you know, the Beach Boys, you know, from Surfing USA to, to I Get Around to California Girl, you know, they're, they're just like all over the radio all sure. the time. And then it just felt like, oh, yeah, like a year went by and we didn't really hear anything from the Beach Boys. And then Good Vibrations, obviously, was like one of the biggest hits in the world. So, so that was everywhere. And I can, I do remember hearing that and thinking, Oh wow. The beach boys are like, they went psychedelic, you know? Sure. <laughs> yeah. But so then after that would have been the time to get beaten up because <laughs> they, they, they kind of went off the, you know, the popularity uh, cliff, at least in my, in my world, like around 67, 68, sure. we're listening to things we thought were heavier, you know? Yeah. At a, when you know that brings up an interesting point though of, of even at the young age of being kindergarten first grade listening to the beach boys and it, still remembering that vividly what did that do in terms of and you mentioned it people trying to emulate the beach boys and their sort of way of living what did that do for you in terms of importance and creating your own musical endeavors at a young age well i can say that that the surfing usa album is really the album that made me want to learn how to play the guitar. You know, it's like hearing, hearing, you know, cause I, I had no idea who Dick Dale was. So hearing things like, like um, let's go tripping and miserly, like the, the guitar sounds on there to me were like amazing and cool. And I just, you know, I had to do, I, I had to know how to do that. And then, and then also seeing, the Beatles on television and how much fun they were having and they all had electric guitars. And so it, it became, you know, a huge influence on me, like as a, you know, eight, nine, 10 year old, I had to get, you know, I had sure. to get a guitar and like bug my parents first, they got me a ukulele and then eventually they got me a guitar. And I think probably by the third grade, I'm pretty much learning how to play the guitar mm -hmm. and starting to even jam with friends at that, at that point. Yeah. Unfortunately, unlike yourself, I, I have no musical ability in, in my blood. I played saxophone for all of five seconds in middle school and I'm more of a shower singer. So anyone who has the musical ability to, in, in that sense, even to play music, I, I hold in high regard because that's a, a trait that is hard to, I'm sure, learn. Well, I don't want to blow myself up. You know, I'm not I'm not a technical guy. I, I'm pretty much more of a feel sure. guitar player. And um, I've always been kind of self-taught or I had a, a really close friend that I was in bands with that was more advanced than me. And he taught me a lot. Um, but I've always just kind of done things by ear. Sure. And, and, you know, now, I mean, I'll cheat. I'll go and look at, you know. Um, stuff online or whatever and you know I bought books some books along the way but um, never never consider myself technically um, like a great musician but I, I do think that I have excellent feel and and um, you know I know where the pocket is <laughs> well, that, that, that makes you you know even closer to the Beach Voicing as they were they maybe besides Carl taking early music lessons for guitar they, they were practically self-taught as well yeah, and I think there's a lot to be said for that because it, it, it's a more organic 
musical experience. Sure. Um, I feel like some really great musicians lose something because there's there's just some kind of an edge that happens where you you become less open to to mistakes. Sure. And mistakes are really where the magic is. If you if, you know if you're if you're open to the to, to listening to things, I, that's one of the brilliant things about Brian Wilson um, is that he didn't really follow the rules musically. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of his things are um, there's dissonance in, in a lot of his music uh, um, from a technical standpoint, and it's like how does you know you know how does how does he make that work? Well, that's that's the genius is when he's just the way he's able to layer textures and layer layer notes that that necessarily you know people would think traditionally wouldn't necessarily go together and sure. um you know he finds the magic in, in there well in a prime example of that and maybe and maybe it's not correct but to me a prime example of that is in the recent documentary about himself he's in the studio and i know this was a few years ago but they're mm -hmm. doing new music and they're in the studio and he's telling they're playing and then um, Paul von Mertens is playing something on the saxophone and it's not what Brian wants. And then Brian says, oh, you got to play it like this way, bah, 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 or whatever it was. And to someone like myself or anyone else, you don't know what that means. It's, oh, he's just making a sound, but then that he knows what it's supposed to sound like and that's what it's supposed to be. And then somehow that translates to Paul and anyone else in the band to, to, to play that correctly. Yeah, and the, the, those Wilson guys, you know, um, I think they're, they're, they're a conduit to to just some sure. something else it's like they they have a vision um that they know what it is that they want to get they don't sometimes they don't articulate it in in a traditional way certainly not in a technical way but they'll work until they find that you know um whatever that kind of unknown thing is that they're striving for musically and 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 um, there's an there's an emotional component sure. to the music that they're seeking yeah. because it's not about it's not about like hitting the mark like a target it's more about hitting that mark where it makes the hair on the back of your neck sure. stand up because something magical and you know almost unexplainable is happening musically Dennis had that for sure, sure. Um, as well and you know Carl Carl's his own musical genius yeah. in his own way. You know, it's funny, um, I recently talked to David Marks and um, just out of the blue, he's like, you know, um, out of the, the Wilsons, Carl was the one who had perfect pitch. Yeah. And he goes, he said, you know, Brian had relative pitch. You know, Brian could be like, um, they'd be in a restaurant and somebody would say, you know, give me, you know, tell me you know what a d you know without any instruments or anything find a d or something like that and brian could find it but it, it took him longer than it would take carl to find yeah. it carl carl could just go boom and and be right on it now i don't know that's his experience david right. being around those guys when they were really young but but he said carl had perfect pitch well i i tell that to my dad when we've gone i've seen brian twice i'll be seeing him again this summer and i've told my dad mm -hmm. and he, he sort of can't comprehend it. Neither can I still being the fan that I am that you know, he started in that group as a young kid, a freshman in high school. And he was there for 30 plus years. And he still, till the end, he still had that voice and that pitch that never changed at all. If anything, and improved over time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's been a long haul for those guys. I mean, even got, it's funny that they, they had already become like a nostalgic, thing in like the early 70s you know sure. like so by 74 yeah. you know and you think well they've really only been at it for 12 13 years at that yeah. point so um yeah that but but yeah they were already considered i mean it, in a way really the all summer long album is a nostalgic kind of look sure. at summer i mean the song all summer long is is about you know sort of um looking back and being sad that it, that it's waning you know the sure. summer is when that thing is waning and that, that's kind of what nostalgia is is where yeah. you're looking back to the sweeter kind of in a bittersweet way um and yeah it, so it's weird nostalgia it's like a double-edged thing you know it's it's like it's what it's made it's given them staying power 
But on the other hand, it's made a lot of people think of them as being less relevant as sure. well. Yeah. I'm curious to, for, for your situation. And Gary Griffin, member of Brian's band who played with the Beach Boys in the late 70s, has said this in interviews he's done where he knew at a young age that I'm going to be with the Beach Boys. For you, and he ended up doing that. For you, did you have any inclination or you know, goal in terms of being where you are today in the realm of, of, of this? No, I never would have. Um, I mean, my, my, my experience that comes into writing these books is, um, it's just from a being a fan and, and being maybe an obsessive fan <laughs> to, to an extent. Um, and that's, you know, I, I, I have some natural ability in writing and, and I've always been a good researcher, but as far as being like a, a, a historian regarding the Beach Boys themselves, um, that came about because I wanted to try writing, you know, I'd written short things and I'd had things published, just short pieces, record reviews sure. um, and things like that. and. People were, comp, comp, I'm pretty old by that time too. Mm -hmm. I'm like around 40 and people are complimenting me on my writing and say, you should really try to write a book at some point. And I'm thinking, well, what would I, you know, and then, uh, you know, it's, it would have to be something that, that motivated me because it's a lot of time and it's a lot of effort. It's a huge sure. commitment. And, and, um, and, and so I started thinking, writing like little, um, treatments and and synopsis and playing around with some ideas and and when i came upon dennis wilson i felt really comfortable because that was the story that really hadn't been told sure. completely you know it was, it was in bits of it were in other books but yeah there had never been a, a, a biography you know focusing solely on him um it's such a great story um it has everything and um, I always really liked Dennis. Um, I always thought there was there was something um, just you know really special about Dennis sure. as a, as a as a personality, as an image, um, and all of that stuff. So so I was naturally motivated. But the other thing that made it great was that my, the culture I grew up in was similar, not oh, not exactly yeah. like his, but I grew up in a car culture. We cruised. We went to the beach, you know, California sun, suburbia, sort of like, um, I sort of garage bands. I sort of knew some things, you know, uh, that were similar to my experience development sure. um, with him. So that helped as well. But I never would have thought any, anything like beyond that book that, you know, I just took it as it came. I wrote that book and it turned out really you know to be um popular reviewed really well and all that so that just led to the other books sure but, yeah. and that i'm sure that also is a gratifying feeling to, to know that what you're writing and, and the story you put out that you're doing your best to show the show the entire story not just in bits and pieces or a one angled view and then to have people appreciate that and really enjoy it brings you know a happiness to yourself that you can sort of take a breather after the work that you put into. Yeah, it was, no, it was really gratifying because um, I felt like, well, you know, I'd been, a, I'd been a musician. Um, we, you know, we had put out some records and stuff. We'd had a little bit of success and, and, um, and then I went on and did, you know, some other things. I mean, I raised a family, which is, you know, the, the, the best thing I've ever done, but um but I wrote some songs and, you know, I'd done, like I said, I'd done some writing and, and things like that. But I, but I feel like the difference between all of that and the Dennis Wilson book is that the Dennis Wilson book allowed me to really make my mark, make sure. my mark as, as an artist or as a writer, because it had, it, you know, it was important in that it had an impact and, and, and the best thing about it is it raised his profile sure which you know i'm like for the you know fighting for the for the sort of underrated yeah. the underrated guy you know it's like i want to get more people paying attention to him um and his story and especially his music and so that you know that happened 
and 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 that you know that's a that, that was an amazing thing for me looking back on it now it's very gratifying sure yeah I want you. You shared this also in another interview you did about a run-in you had with Den- uh, with Dennis in the seventies, mm-hmm. um, uh, around the time of Pacific Ocean Blue, and how you first experienced that. And I'd love to hear it. But also, at, at that point, you know, you're in the you're in a band, you're having su- some success, you're you're running to the Beach Boys. Your thoughts still on that period on their music at that time? Were you listening to it at all? Yeah, I was, and and and. Um not not necessarily so happily i mean you know pacific ocean blue felt like the natural progression you know from holland it's like if they were if they were going to keep progressing artistically to be taken seriously by the world i felt like that you know holland to pacific ocean blue made sense i like love you love you is strange and 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 wonderful in its own way but to me it doesn't have the artistic depth of pacific ocean blue it's it's deep in a different way it's deep in a a quirky comical um trippy you know brian way and and i love it for what it is but it just doesn't have the um to me it doesn't have the 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 darkness the the emotional you know, sure. texture of Pacific Ocean Blue, which, you know, Holland was kind of a moody album. And so, you know, it, it, Holland has some some kind of darkness to it and and um, Pacific Ocean Blue even more. So so I was listening to, you know, NIU and I listened to, you know, 15 Big Ones was just, to me, it was very shallow, sure. kind of fun in a way, but kind of shallow. Um, Love You, Weird. Uh, Pacific Ocean Blue, you know, amazing, uh, and then and then uh, MIU, you know, was just yeah to me, you know, not not very um, gratifying artistically. Um, it has it has some moments, sure, but um, didn't really like it. I tried to, and then and then LA Light album also again, it's it's spotty for me. Sure. So it's like, you know, Baby Blue, amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, Angel Come Home, amazing. Um, you know, to me, the Here Comes the Night disco, didn't, that didn't sit well with me. Sure. It, did, it sounded like a sellout to me in a way, like them just trying, just desperation. Good Time and Always felt a little unfinished to me, like it needed, <laughs> it needed another bridge or it needed, sure. it needed something. But, but you know, I heard, that would get played on the radio in LA at that time. So yeah, yeah, I was listening and I was paying attention um, to their releases as they came out at that time. It's so much different than what I was doing though, as with my band, we were sure. more trying, you know, to be the Ramones or something. Mm-hmm. So, Well, yeah. that, that brings up a, a good point of their music. And I asked uh, Jeffrey this question last week, you know, you have an album like LA Light Album where it has, Angel Come Home, they have Love Surrounds Me, which was from Dennis's album. They have good time and songs of that nature. And then it's coupled with certain songs that don't go with it. And you have MIU, you have My Diane, a a good song, a deep song, a personable song. And then you have some other songs from that. And it's like they they don't fit together. And I'm not not a musical person. I'm not trying to say, oh, they should have changed it to this. But I, I, I feel personally that it's sort of pigeonholed them from at the high level they were to get to that stay at that higher next level do you think that sort of if they change not going to pacific ocean blue for their next step do you think that's why they're sort of at this stage you see the rolling stones selling out with 60,000 100,000 people at their stadiums do you think the reason they don't change to that higher level of music you know pigeonholed them to not be at that same level as those musicians uh, you know, in my opinion, there and it's so. It's just this is just me, my opinion. Um, the it, they have not taken care of their legacy that well. You know, just plain and simple. Um, they made yeah. they made a lot. Of, I, I wrote a, a whole chapter about it in this book right here. Um, it's and it's I can't remember what the chapter is. Um, um, no go showboat. Be, the Beach Boys image problems. And then um, 
and then what's wrong artistic missteps by the beach boys you know and again this was a fun book to write because that's that's my <laughs> the thing that wouldn't die the brief history of beach boys comebacks sure. um but yeah i mean they there's just a, a long list and, and again it's easy you know i'm i'm the the armchair fan here <laughs> and my you know my family's um income and you know all that is not dependent on on this so these guys had to make different decisions as time went by and sure. and whatever um but i feel like why why they there's a lack of respect for them they've had there's been some key points where they really had a chance and they kind of frittered it away in my opinion one of the biggest ones was everything broke right for them uh, 73 74 75 just you know they 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 got their live band was on fire sure. they worked their butts off they blew you know people off the of stage right and left opening for them you know they opened for Crosby Stills Nash and Young on a huge tour and they were blowing them off the stage they they did it with Elton John in England they blew Elton John off the stage and then they went out with with Chicago and did that Bichago uh, tour and they were, you know, getting bigger reactions and uh, um, bigger crowds than the Rolling Stones were at that time. And then, you know, they were voted like the, the band of the year and Rolling Stone just on their live act. And, and the last album had been Holland, which had gotten a lot of critical praise, but you know, had done okay sales wise but not great um then endless summer happened that went to number one they were you know a couple of key songs in the american graffiti film which is a huge film so there was all this attention on them like all the eyes were on them at that point and so it was like the next thing they did was really important it was really crucial and you know what was going to be that next thing do, do they still have it and what they came up with was 15 big ones. And to me, you know, even though 15 big ones was kind of a commercial success, it turned a lot of people off. It turned a lot of, a lot of fans off that, that were, were just like, yeah, they're, you know, they, they, you know, for a while I was thinking the beach boys were cool, but now I listen to that and they're, they're pretty lame. Sure. <laughs> it's yeah. just listening, you know, listening to just, um, it's just kind of a square album you know yeah. <laughs> to me it's not it's not progressive at all it's not deep at all sure. it's kind of fun but it's not it's just not it's not going to get them the kind yeah. of artistic respect that maybe if they had continued with the progression of holland of course then they may not have had a hit with that so so sure. again there's there's these points in their career where you know it happened with smile where it was like that next thing was going to take them to a higher plane, a higher, a higher level of respect artistically. And then it doesn't happen. Sure. And then that, that kind of kills them, you know, yeah. and I think it, it kind of did with, with them, with 15 big ones. I think even though, again, it sold well, I think that a lot, it turned a lot of people off. Well, there's, there's not a whole lot. I, I mean, actually, I should double track that. There's on that, and you bring up a good point on that as well. You, th that album, th there's some, I think, bright spots that, you know, cheery up songs. You see Brian, that same song, you see the choir there, and you say, when looking happy, Brian's into mm -hmm. it. And you have, uh, you know, I, I like some music from the 50s and uh, early 60s. You see uh, Dennis sing in the Still the Night by the uh, Five Saddens, and that's a decent song covered by. But then you, it's an album, it's similar to Still Cruising, not a whole lot of new material on there to get fans going, but then there, but then it somehow goes to the top, similar to uh, Endless Summer. And, it, and again, it went, it went to the top, yeah. not on the merits of itself. It went sure. to the top because there was so much attention and anticipation of yeah. the Beach Boys at that time. It was like anything they put out at that point would have gone, you know, top 20, anything. Sure because everybody wanted the beach boys at that point sure um you know they'd had endless summer went to number one um spirit of america went top 10 
you know, and there's, there, there's all this attention on them. So it was like the thing, you know, and Brian's back, you know, yeah. and Brian's back. Everybody wants to see what Brian's doing. And so, you know, it kind of, you know, it's, it's, again, it's easy for me to criticize it. Um, I can just tell you how it hit me at the time. I wanted to like it, but it just didn't have any, any artistic, real mm -hmm. artistic depth to it. And there are moments like the Hadophonia track is really cool. And, sure. You know, if there's a certain mix of rock and roll music, that's cool. And, um, you know, a lot of people just once in my life think that's brilliant. I listened, just listened to that the other day, you know, re having all these voices in my head bouncing around telling me that that track is so brilliant. And it's, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I don't like the vocal mix on it. I don't like how dry Carl's lead vocal is on it. I think, it's it's just that album, that record has a weird yeah. mix to it, and and it's 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 kind of a precursor in a way of Love You, um, but I think he got he got he got it right on Love You in that it's it's just more unfettered weirdness, sure. you know. And it's like if you want to be weird, just go all the way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? sure. And, well, I like and Love You is weird as hell. Uh, and I li I like the the look of the album for it, fifteen big ones. It's got the the Olympics logo look to to it with the the rings on it. But there's besides besides that, there's not a whole lot to that. On another note, besides that and uh, MIU and all those those albums from that period that sort of make you want to turn away from the Beach Boys if if you're from that period. There's Dennis albums. Dennis's album. We sort of have talked about that to a little bit. You're listening to it the first time. How do you wrap your head around that? Yeah, I, you know, because I'd been hearing, oh, Dennis is working on a solo album, kind of heard that for, you know, throughout the 70s. So, you know, just little reading Cream magazine or whatever, you know, you, you get a, a little two sentence blurb or, or in Rolling Stone or some, somewhere you, it's mentioned in the music press that Dennis is working on a solo album. And I always felt like, well, he's the one who should go solo. Just, sure. you know, he seems kind of different than the rest of them. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, for me, it was a weird situation. So I'd, I'd heard that he was recording a solo album. I had no idea if it would be any good, um, hoping it would be because his solo tracks on, on their records were, you know, were always really interesting, sure. but I, yeah, I had been out partying and I was in somebody's house sleeping on the couch and they had these album premieres on on the radio and it was like late at night it was like midnight and they were doing like the midnight album premiere um uh, and i didn't even hear who it was it was just we're, you know we're playing this uh it's like pre it hadn't even been released yet pre-release uh, and boom you know we're into it and i'm hearing the rivers i'm like, hearing river song and and just going, wow, this is like, this is incredible. It's like, yeah. is it? And I'm thinking, is this the new Springsteen? Because <laughs> I'm listening seriously. I'm, I'm a little buzzed, you know, I'm kind of yeah. falling asleep. This choir thing, you know, Springsteen's um, Born to Run had, had the spectre kind okay. of production to it. And some of Pacific Ocean Blue has a little bit of that. And you know the rough voice, you know the really rough voice, and sure. and it's it's rocking, you know. I mean the drums on it are just like it, it's. It, and and re I remember hearing that and, and wondering, oh, this maybe it's the new Springsteen sure. album because um, I don't know when does Darkness on the Edge of Town come out? I don't think that had even come out yet. So it, so it was like Born to Run was like the last thing. And I'm not like the huge Springsteen fan or anything, but I really liked Born to Run. I thought Born to Run was an amazing album. And my sister bought me a copy. Again, as my sisters were always pointing me to the, <laughs> the next cool thing. Um, and, th and then, you know, the rest of that, I think what's wrong. And, and then what I can't remember the, the sequencing on Pacific Ocean Blue exactly, but, but it just seems so deep. And, sure weird and cool and, and, and just the, you know, just this gritty quality to it. And so then when it went to the time to flip over the album, which is what they used to do back then, the DJ said, okay, we're going to, now we're going to listen to side two of the new 
Dennis Wilson solo album, yeah. Pacific Ocean Blue. And I was just like, oh <laughs> my God. It's because it, it was like, it, you know, it was like John Lennon, David Bowie, Bruce Springsteen, everything cool that was new. It, it was all in there, but you could still hear Brian in there too. Sure. Um, and because you re Dennis really learned his lessons from Brian is like, you know, with the bass notes and making things really thick and, and um, just the way he used, he didn't use harmonies prolifically like Brian, but he did subtly use a lot of cool harmonies and then, you know, throwing gospel choir in there. And, and, but there's, a, there's more of a heaviness to it as well. Um, so yeah, um, her, that first listen was just, it was mind blowing for me. And then I found, <laughs> I was in visiting my sister in Pasadena and went to, um, some shopping mall down there where there's a licorice pizza and I went, walked into licorice pizza and there's like big stacks of Dennis Wilson solo album for sale. Like right when he walked in the door. Like, oh my God, there it is. <laughs> grab, grab my copy and brought it home. Yeah. Well, I, I bought it. It was, and this isn't me just saying, because you, you have written about Dennis and you were in the BBC documentary uh, of Dennis, which is the first time I, I had any sort of inkling of who you were and, and what type of work you did and how that documentary talked about his, his work and his life. But I bought that and it was Amazon. Of course, it's not Amazon Prime shipping, so I have to wait a few weeks and I get it in. River Song and the uh, It's Not Too Late, which he, he collaborated with uh, Carly Munoz and then Time, as we talked about earlier with Johnny Depp before we got going here. Just there's a lot of powerful songs and they're deep songs that make you pause whatever you're doing and just you're, you're thinking about everything you've done up until then. And you're like, man, this is uh, amazing. And then and it's mentioned in I'm sure your book and in the documentary and anything else written about him, everything that transpired transpired after Pacific Ocean Blue yeah. led into uh, what should have been Bamboo and so on and so forth. And it's like, man, if, if that could have been just on the straight path and, you know, figured himself out and got that going, it w just would have been a biggest thing. And it would have really changed, I, I think, the perspective and the path that the Beach Boys took post that and, and what they would have been like you're you're probably right in a way you know there's a lot of promise there i mean i think um i think jim gercio james gercio the guy who signed dennis to to caribou um i think he saw saw that potential he saw dennis had you know he had a similar well of creativity um like brian had it's different it's 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 way more raw it's it's darker um it's brutally dark in some places but um, but the thing is, if you listen to songs like Thoughts of You or Time or, you know, whatever, but you, you can hear, almost hear why, why he ended up like he did. Sure. You can, you know, you can hear that, that the vulnerability and, and the, the sadness, um, the, the depth of darkness that's there, that's kind of following him around you know it, it, um you can you can hear it in in pacific ocean blue you can hear it in, in the bamboo material so it's almost like one of the reasons it's so good is because he was such a tragic figure sure. you know um it's it's like br brilliance and insanity it's a it's a fine edge you know that you're balancing on um you know, genius and insanity. It's like, it, it, it's like right there. Um, and I, you could, you could see him kind of straddling that, straddling that, sure. that place. Um, you can hear, you can hear it in his work and he's really, he's really pouring it out. I mean, he's giving you, he's opening up and sure. showing you exactly what's in, inside. And for a lot of people, that's uncomfortable. A lot of people will say it's too over the top. They, you know, they, 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 it's not a comfortable thing for them to listen to Dennis Wilson sure. for those reasons. And I can understand that. Um, but I love, I love the honesty that's yeah. in, in his stuff. And uh, I think, yeah, I think he, the, the, the reason we still uh, talk about him 
and people are still, you know, being blown away by his by his music is just just because it was so real, you know. Sure. So it's not it wasn't disposable. It wasn't he never was thinking about writing a hit, you know. Yeah. It's not, it wasn't even coming close, you know. It's not that's not at all what it was about. Um, it was just, it, it was about getting out the stuff that was inside of him sure. and, and also being that conduit to, to a, a beautiful thing that the Wilson brothers, they, you know, they sit down at a piano and they start playing notes and, and um, the way that one note joined with a different note causes, you know, causes something else unexplainable and then you add a voice to it and you add a different musical texture to it and they start like envisioning this this thing to build on and it's like i don't even think they necessarily know what they're going for until they get there you know once they get there it's like they know sure. but but they have that that intangible thing it's an innate thing that's that's born into them um gosh i mean pet sound you know yeah. you know you just listen to all of the, the things that are happening in that music um it's it's incredible it's so dense sure it took me years and years to be able to appreciate it i really i didn't even know what i was hearing when i first heard pet sounds it took me i had it was the stereo mix that finally allowed me to really i mean i like the songs i mean uh, wouldn't it be nice and you know god only knows and sleep john b amazing caroline no great songs but just the full impact of pet sounds sure. didn't ever really penetrate with me until i heard the stereo mix and that just opened it up enough for for me to be able to understand it maybe more and now i can really appreciate the mono mix as well but but it took the stereo mix sure. to which I think was nineties, maybe that's the first yeah, I know really they good stereo really mix. Then. Yeah. But it, it, and it, I, I think about it, but then sometimes like now nah, he couldn't, but then maybe Brian did think of the, how at that point that he was, and I feel like he has mentioned this where he, he knew at some point at, with that album, that this was going to be some calling to God where it's this unbelievable record that has a test of time. Cause you can't, it, it's hard to fathom to create something of that nature that nowadays is become more appreciated compared to back then, similar to Pacific ocean blue and a lot of their material that at yeah. first wasn't appreciated, but now it's sort of a, a treasured item. Yeah. And smile as well. Sure. You know, I mean, how heartbreaking that must've been for him because, you know, he put so much of himself into that and um, was so enthusiastic about it and really felt like, this was going to be, you know, the, something so original that nobody could have, could ever have predicted it. You know, it was just, it was going to be the, um, the epic thing, you know, in his artistic s statement, you know, more than Pet Sounds. And sure. you know, I think Dennis said, yeah, the smile tracks are so amazing. They make Pet Sounds sound like, I think he used the S word. <laughs> um, I think that there's a quote from Dennis and I, and I, you know, some people were, some people saw that as being kind of off base, but I, I totally know what he's talking about sure. because, because where Brian was trying to go with smile with things like child's father to the man and, you know, that type of stuff. It's, 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 it's beyond pet sounds. It's, it's um, to me, it's a, it's a, it's, it's certainly a more courageous artistic statement but again you know it's weird and brian you know brian does brian he's a weird guy he does weird <laughs> stuff yeah. he's got weird ideas you know yeah. it's part of what makes him cool well i yeah. i laugh at whenever he says what he whenever he's asked what he was doing in his sandbox he says oh just eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or turkey sandwiches and playing music on his yeah. his piano he's he's just a it's 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 marvelous and you it's it's a happy thing and probably more for you in your situation with the beach boys situation to see him do that and put through pet sounds not pet sounds smile finally and to see this sort of confidence come back to him but also a weight on his shoulder to sort of 
let go to realize, okay, now I can breathe and continue to where I originally wanted to go. Yeah, I'm really impressed. You know, and I got to be impressed with Darian and the, the support system that he had, um, you know, to, to do that, to be, to, to, to just to be able to even go there, let alone sure. have it release and then have it be, become this critically acclaimed thing. And then, you know, Brian, had, you know, the Beach Boys had never won a Grammy. Yeah. And Brian, Brian wins his first Grammy um, with smile material. <laughs> you know, it's just, yeah. it, it, you know, it's, it's, it, it's so weird and cool that that happened that way. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I still feel like in its time, you know, if it had been released in, in whatever, uh, spring of 67 or, or, you know, the very beginning, I don't know, January or February would have been better, but, uh, if that had been released in 67, it, w- it would have changed everybody's perception of sure. what the Beach Boys were. Um, whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know, but they never would have been thought of as sort of um, shallow or, you know, square. Uh, if that thing had come out, it would have, you know, it would have blown a lot of minds. It would have blown the minds of a lot of, you know, heavy people because it was a really weird and trippy um, mm-hmm. experience. But, but unfortunately it didn't. And then, you know, I mean, Smiley Smile is weird in its own way, but again, it, to me, it's, um, it's it, you know, it's, it's not, first, you know, it came out, even eight months in, in 67, it's like, in eight months in 67 is like 15 years now. Sure. <laughs> it really is. I mean, where, you know, where things progressed sure. culturally, um, between late 66 and late 67 is like, you know, 15 or 20 years now. Sure. Yeah. It's, 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 it's just, it's the Beach Boys go with being too early for music in what if situations. We, we talked a, a, a little while ago about your experience and what that meant for you to write the book about Dennis. And I, I mentioned also the, the Dennis, Wilkin, Dennis Wilson documentary the BBC that, that you were part of, which also you were in a lot of scenes and in parts with David Marks, who you're friends with, and you wrote you know his book with him on his sort of story and how he's maneuvered through life. I want to ask you this, if it's okay, it, for you to write that, how important, not only as yourself, as a fan of the Beach Boys and a fan of David's, but for fans, but also David's to share his story to sort of help him accept the fact that he was part of this big group and sort of hit for him to appreciate the time that he had spent there. Yeah, no, that was, that was great. E- e- equally great. Um, and, and, you know, it was nice to get to help a little bit, do a little bit of a, a part of getting Dennis some, some more respect. Um, and with David, it was the same thing again, except it was even nicer because David was, still with us sure. so david is still there so so that he could he could appreciate that happening uh, we had so much fun together doing doing that book he's he's just um he's a really fun uh nice person to be around i mean i'm i, I became friends with him in a way that has nothing to do with the beach boys mm-hmm. it's just you know we just kind of like each other and we have a similar sense of humor and just hanging around um with each other um was always really cool. Um, I like the way he treats my kids. I like the way he, you know, he's respectful to my wife. Um, you know, he's just, uh, it's fun to sit around and play guitars with and whatever. Sure. And he's, he's, he, yeah. And he had to relearn how to accept his, his role in the beach boys as well. Cause he just w- walked away from it and didn't want to have anything to do with it. Sure. So he never, he was never an advocate for himself in their story. Sure. Um, he just let them define him basically. And, and they defined him as, as, you know, the kid across the street who was there for like five minutes, but, you know, didn't really have anything to do now, now looking back, of course, they're, they don't, they don't say it that way, but yeah. that's kind of how he was treated uh, through the sixties. And, and again, he didn't do anything to correct that. 
Sure. He just he just wanted to move on. He didn't he didn't really have that much respect for the Beach Boys. He gained more respect for the Beach Boys later. Um, he had to start <laughs> when, when he. I mean, he knew Brian. He knew Brian was like a god, but um, and and he really looked up to Brian. But but David's more of a blues jazz sure. kind of guy. And so, you know, those those kind of musicians impress him more. But when he really gained a lot of respect for Brian was when he had to, when he went back to the band in like 98. Yeah. And he had to start learning all those Pet Sound <laughs> songs. You know, he had to learn, he had to learn like God Only Knows and he had to learn Wouldn't It Be Nice. And, 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 he, and then he was just like, wow, you know, the boy sings and everything on this are really jazz music and so then he he understood that brian you know brian had gone to you know he knew he, he had a lot of respect for the surfer girl brian because because mm -hmm. he he put the or the in my room brian that put the, the kind of jazz voicings into the into the vocals um but the the tracks were still pretty you know pretty basic back sure. then um but but Brian, you know, grew so much musically that that the tracks really became. I mean, the, the harmonies are amazing and always a knockout. But the tracks really became equally equally deep and important sure. and and creative. And um, yeah, so so it was a cool process with David. Um, we had a lot of fun, you know. <laughs> well, for me to 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 see him sort of accept it in as, as a fan perspective and then to see him be part of the the 50th anniversary tour where he sings get you back which helped got me introduced to the 1985 album which i i, I like because there's a i have a few good songs off of that album and then you see him with brian on his no peer pressure album and then you see him play with brian briefly after the 50th anniversary tour ended prematurely for that, do you think that was how much of a cathartic experience was that? Do you think for him to sort of you know take a breather and it, it, it be part of that? Oh, I think it was it, it was wonderful for him, especially because he got to hang out with his old friends again. Sure, you know, I mean that's that's the other thing is those those are the guys you know. I mean, Brian's a guy he you know taught him how to throw a football, <laughs> you know. I mean, that's like a big thing. The guy yeah. across the street, you know, I mean, I can remember the guy in my neighborhood who taught me how to throw a football and ride a two wheel bike and, you know, that kind of stuff. And Brian was like that guy, you know, sure. for him. So for him to be able to rekindle and hang out, they have this similar, um, I don't know, it's like a slang, you know, it's like, it's, it's a, a sense of humor. They, they all grew up in that, in that neighborhood and they have, you know, similar experiences, even though David, was a little kid compared to Brian and Mike. Yeah. Um, they're still, you know, part of his DNA. Yeah. Um, and, and so, it, it, you know, that was, and he really likes Al too. And, and Al was, you know, him getting to hang out with Al and Mike, you know, Mike, Mike and David have had a good relationship as well um, for the most part. So, so yeah, a lot, a lot of fun for him to be able to just hang out with those guys again because again they're part of his dna they're part yeah. of his his childhood part of the human being that he that he is so that was a big a, you know a big plus for him yeah i forget and i don't know if it was him saying it but it was you know his group so i would think he would be on there david marks and the marks when there was a song or it must have been singles or rarities from that period that he had recorded with that group and it was a song. That's why um, uh, it's somewhere on Spotify that I'm not. Sh it, it, hopefully, I would hopefully it'd be him singing. Is it seemed as though that would be his group that I enjoyed. Being that you've you've written stuff on the Beach Boys and Dennis and um, David, and you've been in documentaries. And but asked earlier about why do you think the Beach Boys aren't on the same level nowadays as the Stones or the Beatles, even though there's only two Beatles left. The, what do you think the cause is or reason is not, you know, monetary reasons, monetary reasons, but the reason why people are, we're, we're accustomed and we're seeing so many productions and documentaries and TV stuff about the Beach Boys. Is it still because they have that big of a, a pull on society or is it just because there's so much to tell? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's the the quality of their of their the best work is un, unmatched. I mean, there's there's nobody better in popular music, in my opinion, and, and it's you know rock, pop, whatever you want to call call it in their era. The 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 best of their material is the best material. Um, you could, you could you could say the Beatles are right there, and I I would be the first to say that. Um, and then and then it's like, well, who else? You know, who who else is that that standard? And you know, you, a lot of people would advocate. You could start n- naming off a lot of bands um, that are that get to a, a similar level. But for for me, with the '60s aesthetic, which the Beach Boys are, they're not. A, you know, they were they, they they did important things in the '70s and and as well and later, I guess. But to me, you know, the Beach Boys are a '60s band, and so, and and to me, the best bands are '60s bands, in my in my opinion. And then the best of the '60s bands are the best of the '60s acts, you know, um, are got to be the Beatles and the Beach Boys, sure. and, um, and the Rolling Stones, yes, but for me as well. Um, but a lot of people think the '70s Stones is their best stuff. I think the '60s Stones is the best stuff. Um, I, I, I really feel like their artistic progression stopped once Brian Jones was gone because he was always the one who added all the interesting textural elements to their, to their music. Um, even though he wasn't the songwriter, he was more of the arranger and more of the, more of the, the guy in the studio that just always put something really interesting on their records. And once he was gone, then their records just became, you know, they're good. They're, yeah. they're rocking. They're but they're like guitar, bass, and drums. You know, essentially, and it's just like you know, blues music or rock. You know, R and B music or rocking blues music. So, you know, they got into funk a little bit, but they didn't really progress artistically. And so I feel like they're they're also so I consider them a '60s band. So the three '60s bands, you know, are very very different. Um, but that would be the Beatles, the Beach Boys, and the Stones to me, or the, and you can make an argument for any of those three as being the best. Sure. Now, now the worst thing the Beatles ever did is probably miles ahead of the worst thing the Beach Boys ever did. So what I'm saying is like the quality control oh, sure, yeah. for the Beatles is like it's the, with the Beatles it's like almost all good. Yeah. There's just very little of it that that it isn't good. Where oh, you're and it's still really good. And it's sure. like you're you're you know, now with the sort of revival with Let It Be because of that film, sure. you're realizing, wow, how hard they worked on those tracks yeah. and and they are really good. Um but it's but it but it maybe isn't quite as good as as Revolver or it's not quite as good as sure. the best stuff on the White Album or whatever. But with the Beach Boys, it's like, you know, you got pet sounds and you have like Beach Boys Today and you know, just Sunflower and these amazing records. And then you've got, you know, you've got MIU, you've got, <laughs> you know, Beach Boys 85, you, yeah. know, or, you know, you have. And, and even the, the really great albums might have one or two not so great tracks. So, sure. so it's quality control and um, it's a big wide swath with the Beach Boys, but the best the, the best of the Beach Boys is definitely as good as any any other artist of their era for sure, in sure. my opinion. Yeah. I've I've asked this to those who have played with the Beach Boys, whether it be Bobby or Gary or Chris Former from the nineties or anyone else in, in, in that world that I've had on who shared their experience of taking the time to do so and the success that comes with being part of that arena, oh. that that group and what they've accomplished seeing that you've accomplished a lot not just in writing but you you've, you've music you had success playing in in your band with records and songs appearing on, on tv shows but also in, in documentary type of things at each process and then also becoming close to the, these guys how do you hone that in not just in the sense of 
you know, telling your friends that you, you, you are experiencing this stuff, but also humbling yourself to know that if I use this in the wrong way, it's going to go bad. But this can also be very beneficial in terms of being able to appreciate stuff. Yeah, for me, it was kind of a window of time. And, and um, I, I, I gave it I gave it kind of everything I had for like 15 years of just, you know, I really put my heart into writing the dentist book and that led to something else and that what that led to something else. And, and I stayed at it. And, and luckily, I got to do some things for BBC. And, um, you know, got to be in the creative process of putting together some documentaries and that type of thing and writing some more books. And, and then I, you know, I kind of came to a point where it felt um, like I just had to take, take a step back. So just some frustrating things happen like they do in any, in any sure. artist's career or whatever. Um, I don't want to, you know, make it like, oh, 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 it was so bad for me. But it just got to a point where um, I felt like I had played, I kind of played out as much as I, I gave it, I, I gave it as much as I wanted to get. Sure. And so maybe like to 2015 or so, I started just kind of step back from it. And and, and the place to step, step back is to just be a fan again. Sure. You know, instead of trying to be like somebody in in that world, and and it's very political, and you know, there's a there's a constant hierarchy that's happening, sure. and you're, you're scrambling, you know, to try to get respect. Um, and I scrambled to try to get respect. I I, I have to admit it. And and um, but I felt like I I did you know I always I did everything I did for the right reasons i did it because i really love them and i and i love their music and and um if they if they interested me enough to keep my my brain active in it um but there there did come a point where where i just sort of retired i kind of semi-retired from it I, I mean i still do things i still do interviews and and you know if there's a television show that wants you know wants me to be a talking head or I've, I've written little things. Um, I, and I, again, I, I may end up writing something I've done. I've worked on a revised version of the Dennis Wilson book. That's way, way, way overdue <laughs> for a lot of different reasons. Um, and then there's a documentary idea again, another one that's, that's swirling around. So, so I'm, I'm always, you know, I always have an iron in the fire, so to sure. speak, but, but I'm not as serious about it as I used sure. to be. I was, re I was really committed and in it for 15 years or so. And really for the last five, six, seven years, I, I've been concentrating more on um, my family and just uh, kind of living a, living a mellower independent life and not worrying too much about scrambling for status sure. or scrambling for respect in that in that world you know nothing's nothing's wrong with you know living a little easy and living that a little, yeah. little worried free um and you know I, I i did i did i think i did as much as i could do you know sure. pretty much and there, 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 you know with that there may be some more but but i'm pretty happy i'm glad i did it and and um it's it's great and i and i'm happy to be a fan still sure. still love them now you you may know more than me and i'm not asking you to, to spill the beans because i wouldn't want you to, to get in trouble for for that situation but this is a, a big year for the group the, the 60th anniversary for all parties involved as a fan perspective in in your situation what would you like to see happen for the group this year you know honestly from and this might seem really cold but from my perspective I kind of wish they had like hung it up in like 1983. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, that's, that's where I'm coming from because um, I just feel like, you know, I mean, 20, 2012 was amazing and, and, and I really loved what they did. And I, I hate the fact that they didn't keep at it, but, um, but I love that reunion. It was so much fun. Luckily I got to go to like four or five, shows and you know that that was so so fun and so amazing 
but I don't really want them to do anything to, to be honest. I, 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 I just, you know, they're, they should just, you know, um, I'm, I'm not the one that's going to be advocating for, for the reunion or for, you know, hoping, hoping for the reunion or whatever. Uh, what happened in 2012 was amazing and surprising and it came out way better than I ever could have dreamed. And the, the, you know, the way that their, their chemistry worked together still, I saw that, I saw a precursor of that. Um, I got invited to, I think it was 2005, maybe 2005 or so. It was after the, um, the dedication of the, the, the monument, sure. you know, the California's landmark. Um, the next year they got um, awarded a platinum uh, for Sounds of Summer. Sure. And it was like a, a, a big press thing that happened on, on the rooftop of mm -hmm. Capitol. And that day, they all came up the elevator together. And it wow. was, you know, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't seen, because Mike didn't come to the, to the landmark thing. Okay. So the, at the landmark, it was just David, Al, and Brian. So Mike and Bruce didn't come to that. So that, that, that Sounds of Summer Platinum Award thing, it was just the press and some capital execs and the beach and the families, you know, the wives and some people. And they came up the elevator together up to the roof and they all came out and it was it was the five. And you know, I, and the Beach Boys to me always worked best as five. Right. And so they come out and it's 2005 or 2006. So still a long ways away from this reunion, but, but it was Al and Bruce and David and Mike and Brian. And I just saw that that day and I looked at it and the way they interacted and the way they were laughing and Brian was the leader and Mike was joking around and David was, you know, right there with them all and just the, the vibe and the chemistry. And I just, you know, it, it hit me. It's like, wow, those guys could still be a band. Sure. They could still be a group. <laughs> they still have, you know, they still have what it takes. Like the yeah. chemistry is there. And I could so totally see that. But then, you know, time goes by and, you know, I mean, Mike was doing his thing very successfully. Brian's doing his thing very successfully. Um, you know, Al kind of tried for a while, but he kind of got shut down. And then David sat in with Mike for a while. And, you know, you're seeing little, little variations of it. So, so it's almost like I'd forgotten what I had seen that day up on the roof. And then yeah. when they came out for that 2012 thing, I saw, you know, they, they were on the, the Grammys, which was weird, but yeah. <laughs> fun, but cool. Nice to see them getting that kind of respect. But we went to, me and Howie Edelson went to um, New Orleans to see them, which was only like maybe their fourth show on that tour. And they, I mean, it was early on the tour and they, they, um, were the headliners at the New Orleans Jazz Festival. And they had like 30,000 people wow. watching them in their set. And they just killed. <laughs> I mean, they were just, they were so good and it was so fun. Um, and that backing band with, you know, the hybrid of Mike's yeah. band and, and, and Brian's band. Um, and they just got better from that point on. Sure. I mean, they were, they, were, uh, they were really on fire by the end of that tour. And, you know, you know, it's just, uh, it was obvious to me, they still worked, you know, as a, sure. the Beach Boys still seemed like the Beach Boys to me at that time. So I never would have guessed it. I never would have even wanted it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so whatever you want that might happen for 60th, I don't know. I've heard, I, I, I just hear, I don't know. I can't really say exactly what I know, sure. but I, I just know that they have, they've tried to, to plan something, whether that something is gonna, sure. I mean, it, the 2012 thing was kind of on a maybe or maybe not basis right yeah. up until the point where it sure. happened. So, so this is gonna be the same way. Well, it's you just, know? it's, it's, it's uh, oh, hopefully something happens because I, and I've said this to other people in, in that, in this world, that 
you know, I, I grew up when, with the Full House rerun. So I saw, you know, when mm-hmm. John Stainless was on there and he was Barbara Ann and when he did Dennis' song Forever and Kokomo and they were doing that on there with the Beach Boys. And then that was sort of it for me. And then getting older into college before I graduated, the, the getting more into the Beach Boys, really listening to Sunflower and Pacific Ocean Blue and all these albums. And you see and, you know, watch videos and luckily technology is advanced now and you have the records, the live album, you're able to see how magical that was. So you, you hope that it happens. And, you know, there's always uh, middle people and those who have, have to sort of help to make that happen. But whatever happens, I'm sure it'll be in the best interest of both the band as well as as the fans. Yeah, I mean, I, I have no predictions. Um, I don't have a stake in it anymore at all. Yeah. It's just, I just sit back like you from kind of the fans perspective, but maybe I'm I'm a li- probably a little more cynical than you are because um, I've seen what's behind the curtain. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. We'll, but, we'll see what happens. But I wish them, I wish them all the best. And, and um, I really am grateful to them, every last one of them, actually, for the joy uh, they have brought me in my life sure. through, through my ears, through listening to their, their, their wonderful music. Sure. Yeah. Now, before I let you go here, and I, I want to say thank you for, for taking the time out to do this, I have a little segment called This or That, based off of the song All This Is That from the Beach Boys Call the Passion So Tough album. And this is a thing where I throw out one or the other, and I either choose this or that. So, you ready? Okay. Uh, the 1985 album or Keeping the Summer Alive? Wow. That's right off the bat. That's a tough one. <laughs> um, I'd probably go with uh, the 85 album because I actually like Get You Back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Carl's solo album, I'll just say his first one, or Brian's first solo album? Brian's first solo album. Uh, Dennis's version of Holy Man or Taylor Hawkins' version of that song? Well, there's not a Dennis version with, oh, with the vocal yeah. on it, so I'll go with the Taylor version because I think it really worked. Uh, a complete version of Tornado, Dennis's potential third album, or New Beach Boys material? Oh, Tornado, for sure. Uh, Ricky Fatar or Bobby Figueroa? Oh. As a drummer, as wow. a drummer, not as a person, just as the drummer. Yeah, because as a person, I, I don't really know Ricky very well. I know Bobby, and he's a wonderful person. Um, as a drummer, I really like Ricky's playing. I, I like Bobby's playing, too, but I'm going to say Ricky because he played on, on um, River Song, and that's one of my favorite sure. drum tracks. Uh, the song Forever or the song Pacific Ocean Blue? forever and then last but certainly not least carly muñoz or greg jacobson Mm, two different cats greg's a friend um and i really like him as a friend um and i think carly is uh is 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 a deeper musical presence than greg sure so so we'll go with carly (laughs) carly for the music sure and greg for just being fun to hang out with and I, on the note of Carly quickly, he had released, I believe it was 2015, his own album of the stuff he worked with Dennis and he mm-hmm. had performed it himself. And it was a, an interesting take on it because it was a different uh, stance. Granted, he's from Puerto Rico, so it's going to sound a little different than um, how Dennis performed it. But I still thought it was pretty good. Well, John, I want to say for the the hour, a little over an hour we spent doing this, it was a, it was a cathartic experience to get your perspective on this world and talk about an album in a group that holds a lot of importance to myself, like yourself and many others out there. So I, I appreciate it once again. Thanks for having me on. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I, I love talking about it and uh, you gave me that opportunity. So thanks. Well, as I, I give the opportunity every time at the end for, for those who, who graciously come on to put out anything that they have coming up or that they'd want to share with the world. No, I got nothing. <laughs> I'm, I play in a, in a local uh, band. We play kind of freeform psychedelic music. And, um, and that's kind of you know, where it's at for me right now. I might, there might be something in the future, in which case I will let you know, but <laughs> nothing, uh, nothing right now nothing to well, promote and that well, feels good <laughs> well if you're out in the area where john's playing you should go see him and next time when whenever that the, the next uh uh thing you're working on project comes out we'll have to do this again if everyone out there if you enjoy this because why the heck wouldn't you enjoy this with the one and only john stebbins do us a favor subscribe like comment share all that fun jazz 
Because years from now, when it's the 70th anniversary of the Beach Boys, you're going to look back and say, holy crap, this was an amazing conversation between John Stebbins and Nolan Carr himself. If you want news and updates regarding the show and future episodes, follow on Twitter, Nolan Carr at Night Show, on Instagram, Nolan Carr at Night. And in the words of Johnny Carson, bid you all a heartfelt good night. Till next time we see each other again.